Hello, here we're going to look at an approach to lymph node cytology and um, in this uh, short talk I have actually simplified the approach in terms of morphology as well as some important questions to tease out the differential diagnosis. So the first step is to recognize the spectrum of conditions that we may encounter and for lymph node FNAs, of course, they could be benign. For example, uh, reactive lymph node, uh, follicular hyperplasia or lymphoid hyperplasia, perhaps in viral lymph adenitis. And we can also have specific infections uh, targeting lymph nodes, for example, TB. And of course, there is the potential of malignancy, uh, among which metastasis are actually more common than primary lymphomas. And one must also bear in mind that the entity that has been aspirated may not actually be a lymph node. Uh, instead, it could be perhaps a slurry gland nodule or even an adnexal or subcutaneous lesion. So in the broad approach, we can do three things. And the first starts with clinical information. And if you're fortunate enough to be performing the FNA, you can actually do a quick physical examination as well as take a short history. Then there is microscopy and, of course, ancillary tests, which may or may not uh, be helpful. So let's take them one by one. In terms of clinical information, age and gender is important. Current medical history, uh, for example, are there any systemic symptoms which could point to infection or lymphoma? Uh, the location of the node is also important. Um, in particular, some sites are quite ominous for malignancy, for example, supraclavicular or deep-seated nodes in the mediastinum or the abdominal cavity. Immunosuppression also predisposes patients not only to infection but also malignancy, including hematolymphoid malignancy. And of course, it is extremely important to know if there is a past history of malignancy. Now, moving on to the second element of microscopy, a uh, good approach would be to look at it at low power first to establish just some very, very basic impressions uh, in terms of tissue architecture, whether the cells primarily come out in cohesive appearing chunks or as dispersed cells. And it's also very important not to forget the background material. For example, a cystic lymph node is always abnormal if it is indeed a lymph node. Otherwise, there may be other differentials such as branchial cleft cyst. When we move into higher power, this is when we focus on cytomorphology and this can help us to answer the question whether or not we're dealing with a lymphoid lesion and also the composition of the lymphoid cells if it is a lymphoid lesion. Now, in terms of ancillary tests, uh, this may not be helpful in all instances and they are useful if we suspect infections, in which case we can obtain material and send it to the microbiology lab. If we suspect um, malignancy, particularly for metastasis, we can perform immunohistochemistry on the cell block. We can also compare the morphology of cells on the cell block to original histology of the primary tumour if available. And of course, we can do flow cytometry or cell block if we suspect lymphoma. So this really depends on your own clinical practice setting. Sometimes uh, if the node is going to be excised, if that is the protocol, then uh, you may actually want to hold off doing ancillary tests on cytology in order not to duplicate tests. And just point here, flow cytometry is not useful if you're suspecting Hodgkin lymphoma because you're likely to pick up the background benign cells rather than the very, very low percentage of lesional cells. So in terms of on-site triage, anything other than a simple reactive lymph node may benefit from ancillary tests. And one of the most versatile ways to collect tissue is to do needle rinse in sterile saline. Uh, if you know you're going to go for a cell block directly, you can prepare this in other ways up front. But if you have cell suspension in saline, you can actually send this for microbiology and even for flow cytometry if it is sent very promptly. So we've looked at the three elements in a broad approach and these are all geared to answering two main questions. First of all, are we dealing with a lymphoid lesion or not? And of course, secondly, is this benign or malignant? So how do we know whether we are dealing with a lymphoid lesion? 
Architecture is an important clue. Usually lymphoid lesions are more discohesive. The cell size is also important. Uh, cells are much smaller for lymphoid lesions and a good point of comparison is the red blood cell. So a normal resting lymphocyte is only very slightly larger than a red blood cell. And of course, if there are a lot of lymphoglandular bodies surrounding the lesional cells or the main cellular component, then we're likely dealing with a lymphoid lesion. So if lymphoid, we then look at the composition of cells, whether it is a mixed or monotonous population. So for a mixed population, most likely, with some exceptions, we are dealing with a reactive lymph node. And uh, I will discuss some false negatives later. If it is a monotonous population, then we are in lymphoma territory, in which case the cell size is actually quite useful. Now, if we're not dealing with a lymphoid lesion, then we also need to focus on the cytomorphology, whether there are benign or malignant features. So an example of a benign non-lymphoid lesion would be granulomas, which can cause tissue fragments. And of course, the possibility of uh, non-lymph node aspirates like adnexal lesions. For malignancies, we would be most worried about metastatic malignancy. So I spoke about uh, two main patterns on low power, and these are when they're predominantly tissue fragments versus predominantly dispersed cells. Let's take a look in turn at the main differentials. When we are dealing with tissue fragments, so do note that I have really simplified this into only a few differential diagnoses, and of course the actual list is much, much longer. But I think it's useful to actually divide this into lymphoid and non-lymphoid entities. So among the lymphoid entities, one of the most common causes for tissue fragments would be lymphohistocytic aggregates or germinal center material. We can see that the material is very mixed. There are tangible body macrophages, there are larger cells, centrocytes, centroblasts, and mixed with smaller cells. And these are often seen in reactive lymph nodes. Sometimes lymphoma, such as anaplastic large cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, can also appear a little bit aggregated. Uh, even large B-cell lymphoma can do this as well. For non-lymphoid lesions, we would look at granulomas and also, of course, uh, metastasis causing tissue fragments. And again, bear in mind the possibility of uh, this not actually being from a lymph node. Now, uh, for the second pattern, dispersed cells, Again, we have the same approach, lymphoid versus non-lymphoid. For lymphoid, uh, if the population is mixed, as I mentioned, it is more likely to be a reactive lymph node with a differential diagnosis of low-grade lymphoma, which I will uh, briefly mention later. In a monotonous population, we are more worried about lymphoma. And of course, if there's a pattern of scattered large cells on a background of small cells, we would think about Hodgkin lymphoma, or perhaps not so common entities like T-cell rich B-cell lymphoma. By and large, this Hodgkin would actually be the main differential. And for non-lymphoid lesions, sometimes metastatic polydifferentiated carcinoma, including small cell carcinoma or undifferentiated carcinoma, can actually uh, have a dispersed cell pattern as well. And very importantly, so can metastatic melanoma. So I mentioned that cell size is quite important if we are suspecting a lymphoma, and I'm just going to give you some examples of the commoner lymphomas in relation to cell size. So a small resting lymphocyte is roughly about 8 microns, just very slightly larger than a red blood cell. It has a round nucleus and smooth membrane and relatively dark and coarse chromatin. The lymphomas in the small cell group, these are slightly larger than the resting lymphocyte, up to one and a half times the diameter. So this includes uh, SLL, mental cell lymphoma as well. When we are talking about medium-sized cells, up to two times the size of a resting lymphocyte, Burkitt lymphoma is an example, as well as lymphoblastic lymphoma, which we know um, can occur in younger patients. Sometimes mental cell lymphoma also is composed of larger cells. And of course, for much larger cells that are more than two times the size of a resting lymphocyte, um, we're dealing with large B-cell lymphoma, for example. So here are some examples taken at the same magnification. So this is a case of small lymphocytic lymphoma. And this uh, is a medium-sized cell lymphoma. So here is an example of Burkitt lymphoma. You can see that they are larger, up to two times the size of red blood cells. And this is an example of 
diffuse large B-cell lymphoma where you can see that uh, the cells are definitely more than two times the size or the diameter of red blood cells. Now let's quickly take a look at some pitfalls and there are three categories that I will discuss. Potential false positives, false negatives and uh, lymphoma mimics. For false positives, reactive lymph adenitis, in particular in viral lymph adenitis, for example in infectious mononucleosis, this can actually uh, give rise to very frightening looking cells, namely immunoblasts, which can very closely resemble reed sternberg cells. So one of the clues is that there is a range of cell sizes and types, and also quite often uh, you would encounter plasma cytoid cells. Of course, the clinical picture and serology would be extremely helpful in these instances. This is another entity which occurs in young patients of uh, Asian descent, and um, this can actually have quite a predominant medium-sized to large cell population. And the key is really this cell. So this is necrotizing histocytic lymphadenitis, which can be associated with autoimmune diseases as well as seen in Kikuchi Fujimoto disease. Of course, uh, very, very helpful are the presence of crescentic histiocytes with these crescent-shaped eccentric nuclei and karyorectic debris, both in the cytoplasm as well as in the background. In my personal experience, sometimes these aspirates can look quite frightening at low magnification because of the predominance of larger lymphocytes, but the patients are almost always young. In terms of potential false negatives where we may encounter a mixed lymphoid population, we are most concerned about low-grade lymphomas, particularly marginal zone lymphoma and low-grade follicular lymphoma. Um, nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma can also be missed because uh, the abnormal cells uh, sometimes actually are not as obvious as classical reed Sternberg cells and also they are not as many. T-cell lymphomas can also give rise to a mixed cell population which uh, can potentially be missed and it's important to note that often these patients are quite ill and they may also have systemic symptoms and generalized lymph adenopathy. So sometimes there may be a predominant cell size that is medium rather than small. So this is actually quite subtle and subjective, but it may be a subtle clue that we may be dealing with a low-grade lymphoma. Ancillary tests such as flow cytometry uh, and, of course, knowing the clinical history uh, is very useful in these contexts. So here is an example of two cases, one of which is a marginal zone lymphoma and the other is taken from a reactive lymph node. And uh, the challenge is to tell them apart. So actually, uh, this is taken from a case of histologically confirmed marginal zone lymphoma. And you can see that certainly there is a mixed lymphoid population with a predominant population of small lymphocytes. And if um, there is no other forthcoming clinical information, this could very well uh, be reported as a reactive lymph node. So it is helpful to add a caveat to your reports if you are calling something reactive. Uh, perhaps a statement such as further investigation or tissue biopsy may be indicated if lymph adenopathy persists. Now coming on to the last pitfall that is mimics of lymphoma, um, here is a particular entity that can be quite dispersed and be composed of very small cells if you compare them to the red blood cells, certainly closely resembling a hematolymphoid malignancy. And actually this is an example of metastatic melanoma. So this is known as the great mimic for good reason. Um, one of the clues is that there is sometimes this little pouch of cytoplasm and the nucleus is quite eccentric. Undifferentiated carcinoma as well as small cell carcinoma can also sometimes smear as very dispersed cells, uh, as well as other small round blue cell tumors, which is why a history of known malignancy is very important. So in summary, this is the approach that I've presented Think about whether you're dealing with a lymphoid or a non-lymphoid lesion, and here are some of the clues. For a lymphoid lesion, is it mixed or monotonous? Um, if it's mixed, probably reactive, but with these potential 
uh, false negatives. And if it is monotonous, probably lymphoma. And it's quite helpful to actually try to place them into known entities. And if it's non-lymphoid, we can focus on cytomorphology. It could be a benign condition such as granulomatous lymphadenitis or even a non-lymphoid lesion. And of course, uh, metastatic malignancy is high up on the list for non-lymphoid lesions. There can be some mimics to lymphoma. For example, poorly differentiated carcinoma or melanoma may come out as dispersed cells. And of course, this is really not a comprehensive list uh, of even false negatives or mimics, but hopefully they will provide a useful guide by which you can approach lymph node cytology. Thank you.